Hello, my name's Julia Lovell and Jessica Harrison Hall and I have put together the exhibition China's Hidden Century at the British Museum. It's wonderful to be here to introduce this exhibition on late imperial 19th century China that we've been working on for a few years now. We're each going to speak for about 25 minutes. I'm going to give an introduction to the major events and themes of the period covered by the exhibition. Then Jessica is going to talk in more detail about the stories that we've aimed to tell through our selection and arrangement of objects. Now we've sometimes called the period covered by the exhibition China's long 19th century, borrowing a term that's used for European history. So in the European context, this term stretches from the French Revolution in 1789 through to the start of the First World War in 1914, and it covers the huge range of political, social, cultural, economic, military and technological, technological changes that this period witnesses. Of course, the French Revolution and the First World War don't work as bookends for China's own long 19th century, as these are two Europe focused events. And while this exhibition fully acknowledges the impact on late imperial China of European empires, as curators, we wanted to focus on responses from within the Qing Empire to this late imperial period. So we always wanted to work around dates and events that made sense from within a Qing context. For our exhibition's long 19th century, we therefore use instead the beginning and end of reign periods of emperors of the Qing, China's last imperial dynasty. We begin in 1796 with the abdication of the Qianlong Emperor and the accession of the fifth emperor of the Qing, Jia Qing. And we end in 1912 with the abdication of the last emperor, the child, uh, the child Pu'i. These reign periods coincide with major historical processes or moments of change. 1796 and the abdication of the Qianlong Emperor are seen as the end of what some call the High Qing. So this, the High Qing is a period of huge political and social and cultural self-confidence. Um, and 1796 is also seen as the beginning of a period of protracted crisis and transformation. And in 1912, the last emperor, Pu Yi, stepped down, bringing some 2000 years of dynastic rule to an end and making way for a republic. Now, for decades, this long century in China has, I think, been rather underestimated as a period of existence. Chinese and Western histories have often defined it as one of political, military and economic disaster and humiliation and of cultural stagnation. So if you look at big published overviews of Chinese art, they often skate over or even leave out the period between 1796 and 1912. But in the exhibition, we try to argue that although this was indeed a time of profound turbulence and crisis for the Qing Emperor and for China, this was also a time of innovation, resilience and extraordinary transformations. This part of Chinese history is roughly the same period as the Victorian and Edwardian eras in Britain, the latter being a crucial period in building modern Britain and also the world. Britain during this period becomes a fully industrial country. It sells its goods all over the world. You have a revolution in communications and transport, railways, steamships, the telegraph, the telephone, photography. There are inventions that shrink the world that enable globalization and modern me media. This is a time of dramatic political change, people discussing, developing and implementing democracy. Cities are growing, it's the start of a national education system and the start of a women's movement demanding equality and the right to vote. So in other words, in many ways, this period in Britain is the bridge to the world we inhabit now. And the same holds for 19th century China. Between 1796 and 1912, China moved from being an empire ruled by the emperors of a single family or dynasty, the Qing dynasty, to being a modern republic. So here's a quick timeline of the Qing dynasty. 
the technologies that transform Victorian Britain reach China too. Uh, railways, steamships, uh, photography, uh, electricity, modern newspapers begin in China, bringing remote parts of China in instant contact, not only with each other, but also with the rest of the globe. Chinese people are traveling more than ever before, both within and far beyond China. People are learning about and using things designed, invented, made all over the world. So medicines, vehicles, clothes, food. By the start of the 20th century in uh, Qing, China, you've got a national network of schools. You've got quickly growing cities. People are questioning old rules, old hierarchies. They're, they're talking about the need for democracy. You've got a women's movement, women becoming revolutionaries, taking a role in national politics. And remarkably, for much of the 19th century, both Britain and China have female rulers. So Queen Victoria in Britain and Dowager Empress Cixi in China. So our exhibition treats the experiences of 19th century China as an essential bridge to 20th and 21st century China. It's a period when China is dragged violently into a Western dominated world order when politics, culture, and everyday life are opened up to global influences and exchanges with an unprecedented intensity. People are debating new political ideas and ways of governing the country. So cultural traditions are being challenged, added to, and remade. And I'm going to run very quickly through some of the key historical coordinates in the century to help you navigate this period. But a few words first about who the Qing were. The Qing were not an ethnically Han Chinese dynasty. They originated from a tribe of warriors, hunters and traders from Manchuria in the Northeast and took over the old Ming Chinese empire in 1644. Over the next 100 or 150 years, the Qing were spectacularly successful. They added to the old Ming Chinese empire, what's now uh, in Mongolia, Xinjiang. They gained political domination over Tibet. It's hard to find an ideal map to represent this process, but this one on the right here at least gives a sense of the vast territorial expansion that the Qing undertake in the uh, late 17th and 18th centuries. So the pale green core of the picture is roughly the extent of the old Ming Empire. The bigger, bold black outline sketches the extent of Qing dominion. The Qing were political and cultural omnivores. They absorbed a huge range of things, ideas and strategies to increase their power over their huge Central Asian and East Asian empire. They were a multi-faith, multilingual power. Their emperors and elites were expected to have an outstanding grasp of Chinese literature and philosophy, of Tibetan Buddhism, of the warlike Manchu and Mongolian disciplines of riding and shooting. And through the 18th century, the Qing Empire grew rich on commerce. So well into the 19th century, in fact, Qing China was one of the central manufacturers and exporters of luxury goods in the world. So by the beginning of China's long 19th century, the Qing Empire was one of the largest and most successful empires, not just in the world at the time, but arguably in world history. But after 1800, circumstances conspired against the Qing. The population had grown hugely in the 18th century. It had at least doubled between 1650 and 1800 to reach 300 million. But the population boom led to a squeeze on land, work and resources. Prices were rising. Government was too small to function adequately. Corruption increased. All these issues generated popular discontent and local rebellions and insurgencies which the central government lacked the resources to suppress. The armies of the Qing, which had been so phenomenally successful in the 18th century, began to falter. And domestic discontent was very expensive to deal with. So Qing government revenues never recovered from the cost of suppressing some major rebellions known as the White Lotus, the Bailian Jiao Qi in 1804. But the greatest challenge that the Qing faced in the 19th century was a new one, the expansion of Europe, United States, and later Japan. Now in the early 1800s, industrializing Western countries sought new markets for their products through free trade with the rest of the world. The belief went that the more trade a nation carried out, the richer and more powerful its citizens, government, and armies would be. So the huge empire of China under the Qing was an obvious target for such countries. But 
Unsurprisingly, the Qing wanted to stay in control of its borders and foreign trade. And since 1757, it had restricted all European, including Indian and American traders to the southern city of Guangzhou or Canton. So the stage was set for conflict between the Qing and Western countries. Now, Britain in particular had a major trade deficit with Qing China. By the 18th century, Great Britain was addicted to China's signature exports of tea, silk, ceramics, and so on. The problem for Britain was that China didn't seem to want enough British goods back to balance the books. So as a result, tens of millions of silver dollars were flowing out of Europe and into China to buy tea and silk and so on for all those British consumers. But around 1800, British merchants found something that Chinese people would buy in large quantities, opium. From the late 18th century, the British government forced farmers in India, parts of which were under British control, to grow poppies. It extracted and processed opium. Then British traders shipped opium to China, where growing numbers of people started using it. British traders exchange opium for silver and use the silver to buy tea and other Chinese exports. The taxes that the British government took on the tea back in Britain covered a good deal of the costs of the British Navy. So it's possible to say that opium and the opium trade kept the British Empire afloat. But the Qing government was understandably very concerned about growing numbers of Chinese people smoking opium. They were worried it would pull society apart, as well as burning through cash. So in 1838, the Qing Emperor decided to eliminate opium use in China and sent a special investigator, a man called uh, Lin Zexu, uh, who's pictured here. Uh, the Emperor sent him to South China, where most of the opium entered China. Lin Zexu destroyed all the opium he could get hold of and told British and American opium traders that they must stop smuggling the drug. But the British government decided to declare war on China by sending a fleet of warships in order to demand compensation for the British opium that Lin had destroyed. That war was called the First Opium War, and it was the first war between China and a Western country. So the superior ships and guns of the British secured victory against the Qing in 1842. Now, the First Opium War had three big sets of consequences. First, military. The once fearsome Qing military had been outgunned by modern British firepower. Second, economic. After the power of British gunboats forced the Qing Emperor Dao Guang to negotiate, the British extracted a huge indemnity, 21 million Mexican silver dollars, the island of Hong Kong, and the right to trade at more ports along China's coast. This established the impoverishing principle that the Qing would have to pay vast sums to foreign powers just because they'd lost a war that was not of their choosing. And third, the consequences were political. The Opium War brought the Qing government into direct negotiation with European powers and the US, who used new European concepts of international law to broker treaties that massively favoured the West. So in this way, the first Opium War eroded Qing sovereignty and ability to control its relations with Western nations. And we can see this pattern being repeated with ever greater intensity through the long 19th century with the Second Opium War in the 1850s, the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 95, the Boxer War of 1900 to 1901. I don't have time to describe them all in detail in this talk, but the exhibition, its books, and I fully acknowledge the enormity of their impact on China. Now, there was a direct connection between this increased European presence and the greatest human disaster of China's 19th century, the Taiping Civil War, which began in 1850 and was the most destructive of the internal conflicts of the late Qing. This war originated in the visions of an educated man from South China called Hong Xiuqian, who failed multiple times the notoriously competitive civil service exams that were the gateway to a prized government job. While taking and failing the exams, Hong picked up a Christian pamphlet in Chinese, and this was available because European and especially Protestant missionaries took advantage of the post-Opium War opening of China's coasts to proselytize about Christianity. After failing the exams, Hong became delirious with disappointment. He dreamed that he was Jesus Christ's younger Chinese brother and that the Christian God wanted him to rid 
China of the foreign, the Manchu Qing. And that's the genesis of the Taiping War. Hong and his allies, extremely talented soldiers, built an army of followers. And Hong promised something simple and reassuring to people who'd been left desperate by the economic and military precariousness of mid-century rural China. He promised to share out all resources equally and also salvation for all who followed him. By 1853, Taiping armies held much of southern, central and eastern China while planning military expeditions to dislodge the Qing from the capital in Beijing. In 1861 then, things looked objectively dire for the Qing. The young emperor Xianfeng died in exile from Beijing, which British and French soldiers had looted and burned the previous year. They'd also looted and burned the emperor's own beautiful summer palace. And most of the southeast of China was occupied by Taiping forces who were determined to destroy the Qing. Xianfeng's only son was five, far too young to rule except as a figurehead, the Tongzhi Emperor. But at this moment, two of the most remarkable political personalities of the late Qing emerged. Xianfeng's Empress uh, Zixi and Xianfeng's brother Prince Gong, Gong Qingwang, took over as regents. Prince Gong created a foreign office to deal directly with Western nations. Zixi appointed hardworking, talented Chinese officials to reorganize and modernize Qing armies that had been devastated by the Taiping War. So men like uh, Zhong Guofan, uh, Li Hongzhang and Zhuo Zongtang, pictured here, managed new arsenals and shipyards. They promoted bankers and financiers to find foreign funds for armies and industries. And finally, in 1864, armies led by Tsong Guofan defeated the Taiping. But the human cost was enormous. Between 20 and 70 million people are estimated to have lost their lives in the 14 year conflict. Now, Qing China had always been open to a range of influences and contacts with Central Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Russia, and through Guangzhou with Europe, India, and the United States. Global contacts greatly intensified after the two opium wars. Back in 1840, Lin Zexu had begun systematic translation of European knowledge into Chinese. After 1860, Chinese students began to study abroad too. Missionaries built schools and hospitals in China. Increasing numbers of ports, both on the coast and inland, became so-called treaty ports, opened foreign trade. These ports had extraterritorial zones uh, governed by the law and taxation regimes of the country that controlled that zone rather than by the law of the Qing. This was, of course, an erosion of Qing sovereignty and a place where the Chinese population could suffer horrendous racism. But these cities could also offer commercial opportunities uh, for middlemen working with foreigners, for artists and writers creating for new consumer markets. So here on the left is a painting by uh, Rin Bonien, one of the great Shanghai painters. It's a painting of himself with a couple of customers. From the 1870s onwards, China's first modern newspapers and magazines mushroomed, especially in Shanghai. And this new print culture informed readers through factual reports of what was going on in distant parts of the empire and also entertained them with exciting new fiction. It's possible to argue then that huge challenges notwithstanding, the Qing between the 1860s and 1880s displayed remarkable tenacity in holding on, in rebooting after the crisis of the Taiping Civil War. But two external wars between 1894 and 1901 essentially derailed the reform effort. The 1894 war with Japan was fought over control of Korea, which had previously been a tributary state pledging allegiance to the Qing. In the conflict, the Qing lost many of its newly modernized troops and warships. Japan extracted an enormous punishing indemnity and Taiwan as a colony. And this had a huge psychological as well as military and economic impact on the Qing. Now, for centuries, Japan had borrowed from Chinese culture and philosophy. But in 1895, Japan showed that it had overtaken China in the race to modernize, to catch up with the West. 
The shock of China's defeat by Japan pushed some of China's most brilliant men to call for a, for a total transformation of Qing government. They argued that the imperial state needed to reorganize and model itself on the modern institutions of the Western nation state. They argued that China needed modern government departments to organize things like defense, industry and education. Now, the Dowager Empress Cixi was still dominant at court and she resisted these ideas, um, sometimes violently, until external events forced her hand. Now, the climax of external aggression against the Qing came with the Boxer War of 1900 to 1901. Um, after a provoked eruption of anti-Christian, anti-foreign violence across North China, an allied force drawn from six Western powers plus Japan and Russia brutishly occupied Beijing and Tianjin in the north of China. They drove the Qing court into temporary exile, they vandalized the capital and extracted yet another heavy indemnity. When Cixi returned to Beijing from exile in 1902, she enacted a series of reforms more radical than anything suggested in the 1890s. They introduced railways, modern ministries of justice, trade, police, communications, and an empire-wide system of schools. Supporters of the Qing, like Cixi, hoped these reforms would strengthen their empire and their subjects. But this rapid modernization also spread new ideas about change that actually made many people more impatient with the old imperial system as a whole. The breakdown of old certainties that accelerated in the 1890s produced not only reformers, but also out and out revolutionaries, men and also women devoted to overthrowing the entire imperial system. And one of these was a man best known in English as Sun Yat-sen. Uh, he was born in South China, educated in Hong Kong and Hawaii, and in 1895 he began a career as a professional itinerant revolutionary, fighting for a republican nationalist state. Female activists, reformers and revolutionaries joined these often passionate arguments about where China should, should head. And one of the most famous examples was a cross-dressing Chinese feminist poet called Chu Jin, who plotted for the end of the Qing and was beheaded in 1907 for her activism. Now, after almost a decade and a half of failed revolutionary attempts, the revolution ended up happening almost by accident. On the 9th of October 1911, a cell of revolutionaries in the Qing army were making bombs in Hankou, a major city in central China, when they accidentally detonated one of their explosives. So the revolutionaries decided to act quickly before they were arrested and executed. Um, they mutinied and after a day of this mutiny in nearby barracks, the forces loyal to the Qing were defeated and this revolt, this revolution by accident almost spread through army headquarters up and down the country. But a political vacuum lay at the heart of this sudden unplanned civil war. It didn't even have a leader as Sun Yat-sen was out of the country when it kicked off. And it was a former general in the Qing, a man called uh, Yuan Shikai, who ended up dominating the situation thanks to his control of army garrisons around Beijing. He negotiated the abdication of the last emperor in February 1912 and became president of the new republic. Now, the revolution of 1912 left many questions unanswered. Questions like what form would China's government take? How would it avoid domination by military strongmen? How could it protect China from external aggression and so on? What's certain though, is that between 1796 and 1912, China transformed dramatically from dynastic empire to modern Republican nation. Despite huge external and internal challenges, the country saw a fluorescence of new ideas, culture and objects. And this often generated a flexibility and hybridity in art, literature and everyday life that creatively fused the local and the foreign, the uh, aesthetic and the commercial, the elite and the popular.
And I'm going to hand over to Jessica Harrison Hall now to explain how we tried to represent some of these themes, some of these phenomena in the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. This has been a project begun in 2018 and will be completed in 2024, resulting in the exhibition and ultimately three books. One, a themed exhibition catalogue. Two, a book of life stories in an age equivalent to Queen Victoria, Darwin and Dickens. And three, a book of the arts of the 19th century, resulting from the June 2023 conference. There are too many people to thank. At least 400 people have contributed from 20 different countries for this project. None of it would have been possible without the 30 lenders who so generously shared their collections and at least another 30 with whom we discussed loans or included images in the book. Some 1000 images altogether from a pool of about 3000 objects which were examined. Many thanks indeed go to the key sponsors, to the Arts and Humanities Research Council, to Citibank, Core Foundation, and a group of individual sponsors and supporters. One of the most interesting uh, aspects of the project for me has been the Creators of Modern China book, bringing together a hundred scholars, looking at men and women of different backgrounds across the long 19th century, through the expertise of scholars of all stages of their careers, a collective effort achieved during the COVID pandemic and realized as we emerge back into the free world. The exhibition is very much about listening to the voices of the past and to giving voices or images to those which are missing. The idea of this kind of incredible lightness of being permeates the show as figures move from the shadows into the light. What could be more appropriate than the poet Jack Dan, the Manchu poet studied by Sarah Brahma Ramos? Um, like all of us, he wonders, who me? What's rare about me? My talent, my capabilities, they are but shadows. What wisdom, powder and fripperies on a tree stump? So we open the exhibition designed by Nissen Richards with an incredible map of how the Qing saw the world and their empire within it in 1800. Visitors can look for their hometowns or, or countries and marvel perhaps at the insignificant island in the sea, top left, that is Britain. The exhibition is brought together through groups of people, the court, military, elite, urban, global reformers and revolutionaries. And within each of these sections, there is a lead character with an image or costume, a shadow and voice, showing the multicultural nature of the Qing empire and different identities within the 19th century. We start, however, with an unknown woman. China had a population of around 400 million, of whom 200 million would have been women, and very little was known about them, their bio, particularly their biographies. Mostly they are known through the famous actions of their fathers, their husbands, or their sons. And this woman, who's our first character, um, we've had to, to create her persona. We've had to really read this painting. This painting has very little history attached to it, but we know through the blue background on which it is painted that it's a court portrait. We know from the three earrings within her earlobe that it's a portrait of a Manchu woman because that's a symbol of Manchu identity. And we know from the details of the color of her robe, which is a new color introduced in the 19th century, that that's the date of her life. And we have other details like her beautiful headdress made from kingfisher feathers, pearl, coral and jade, and the lips which are only painted on the bottom lip. To give her a form, we've studied the costumes and the jewellery, such as the, this amazing headdress um, made for a Manchu woman, which is um, covered with auspicious images like the 
um, little bats which encircle the show characters, the abstractive long life characters and other details. And together with Nissen Richards, the designers and the London College of Fashion, and with a masterclass by the Oscar winning designer, Tim Yip, we've created um, shadows of these figures throughout the exhibition. And here you can see the London College of Fashion students creating the costume and the headdress for the unknown woman based on the painting and then having, having it shot in various different ways through a screen in order to create a, a presence for the character. For those characters that have um, written records attached to them throughout the exhibition, we've used those for their voices. But in the case of the unknown woman, there was no text. And so a poem has been used, which describes um, a woman looking longingly at the freedom, the flight of a butterfly from her compound, that she's not free to leave to roam. And this uh, gives the character her own voice. In the first section of the exhibition after the introduction, we have the court, and this is divided into three sections between changing representations of people, new developments in imperial dress, accessories and furnishings, and an area devoted to um, introducing different kinds of entertainments at court, to Peking opera, and ultimately to, to ballet. And all of these sections relate closely to the arts and humanities research project, which underpins it. Emperors in the 19th century, um, we originally planned to borrow their portraits from China, from the Palace Museum, but a perfect storm um, centered around COVID left us with insufficient time and funds, uh, despite the kind offer of many of the museums across China, as well as private collectors to borrow these items. So instead, Chinese museums, libraries and university staff have made an incredible contribution to the project, from essays in the books, to voices recorded for the characters, to films within the exhibition, online discussions, and incredible generous sharing of images. So she is the key character in our first court section. And as Julia has already mentioned, she dominated um, the court from the mid 19th century, being the wife of Xianfeng, the mother of Tongzhe and the aunt of Guangxu. There are three adult male emperors who rule in the first half of the 19th century, and then Sushi's regency dominates the second half. So in order to create the character for Sushi, again, we work with the London College of Fashion, but we also um, recorded her voice. And this appears in Manchu and also in Chinese and centers on a quotation about her relationship or her view of Queen Victoria. So Sushi said that she often thought she was the cleverest woman that ever lived and that others couldn't compare with me. Although Queen Victoria, she knew about Queen Victoria in a part of her life which was translated into Chinese. She felt that her own life was much more eventful than Queen Victoria and having 400 million people under con her control and with everyone dependent on her judgment. So we recorded with um, Dr. Cho Yi Tong, the voice of Sushi, and we used the robe from the Metropolitan Museum of Art to represent her within the exhibition. And this is an extraordinary garment, um, which is um, festooned with um, imagery, which supports uh, Sushi's position and her interest in prolonging her life. The main image on front and back is a swooping phoenix with peacock tail, which derives from Japanese art. The form, the full form is Manchu, the sleeves are Han, and the dyes derive from European sources. We also have included in the exhibition many items that come from regional museums across the UK. Um, in the Palace Museum, there are 700 paintings by the Dowager Empress or by her ghost artists. And there are also many that are in um, UK regional museums. This particular one dated 1902 comes from the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. 
Picking opera was performed for pleasure at court to celebrate birthdays and special occasions. There were all male and all female troops and the National Library of China have supplied images of these being worn. Sissy was also very receptive to modern dance and we show a film of Yu Rongling, whose father was um, a diplomat posted to Tokyo and to Paris and who introduced modern dance, ballet and other forms of dance to the court. Within the military, this divides between different types of military men, bannermen, the Green Standard Army, then a succession of foreign and domestic conflicts, which Julia has already outlined. And then finally, a celebration of victory um, imagery at the end of the section. So for this section, we've chosen the bannerman as the key character and his costume was recreated by the fashion students. His voice derives from a Chenlong painting of a general called Mingyang and is recorded in Manchu by Lars Lahman from the School of Oriental and African Studies. We display this extraordinary portrait of the Bannerman uh, together with armor, which comes from slightly later in the period, which comes from Metropolitan Museum of Art and has its original box and a collection of thumb rings. These were worn on the hand that pulled the drawstring, originally to help give a sort of snappier release to the arrow, and then gradually it became a Manchu identifier, accessory, and then spread to Han society. So here you can see this extraordinary um, uh, uniform for a bannerman, complete with these embroidered roundels of dragons. We also draw to the attention of the visitors individual Bannerman's lives. There's an album which is painted with a birthday outing and then a book, um, three volumes of which we have on display of Wan Yen Lin Ching, the Manchu Bannerman who wrote this memoir of wild goose tracks in the snow. And it's illustrated by famous artists of the region. In fact, his mother was a famous poet um, who also created an anthology of poetry. And you can see him here throwing a banquet for her. He's just to the right of the main table in the center and then she's to his left. In the elite section, we look at artists and the network, their networks. They were resilient in the face of conflict and scholars turned to the past for inspiration and created new networks of patronage. And we look at the role of Shanghai and the role of new technologies within the elite. The Shanghai Museum has supplied an amazing um, film which shows this piece of calligraphy, the studio of one step back to create the atmosphere of a scholar's um, studio in which we show a series of paintings. One of the paintings which actually inspired the entire project was this image of Run Xiong, probably the most famous um, self-portrait in Chinese art, complete with its self-questioning um, inscription. And this is a remarkable uh, artwork which combines a sort of calligraphic um, drapery together with almost a photographic face. And the students recreated these folds of cloth in order to create the shadows and shot again behind the screen. Ren Xiong spent a long time with um, Yao Xie as his patron. Yao Xie lives between 1805 and 1864. And he was a man who passed uh, regional exams but had failed to pass the final um, metropolitan exams. But um, continued throughout his life to create extraordinary artwork and poetry. And together with Run Xiong, they created some of the most um, famous collaborative works of the 19th century. Within the exhibition, we have this amazing portrait that comes from a private collection, which shows one of Yao Xie's wives painted by Run Xiong. If he hadn't captured her in this autumnal evening, it would never have come to light um, an image of her at all, which would have survived. In the local life section, we create a kind of streetscape with people's portraits, their costumes and furnishing, furnishings, and try to give a, an idea 
of what life was like um, within a city landscape. So hanging from the ceilings, you have these amazing banners, which come from a 19th century um, painted album. And although there are few traces of ordinary people, we've tried to include some, including this amazing waterproof cape, which has been conserved within the British Museum, including cleaning each piece of straw by hand and then humidifying just enough to get onto the mannequin. There are extraordinary works of art which combine the sort of new technologies of the day with traditional arts, such as this embroidered portrait, which looks as if it is a um, photograph, but in fact is entirely hand-stitched. The key image within the urban section is Lady Lee. This is a woman who has lived a very ordinary life. Um, she is a Buddhist, stuck to a strict vegetarian diet, survived really the traumas of the 19th century to live into old age and has lived a good but very ordinary life. And we were determined to showcase her on the exhibition poster and on the book cover giving a voice to the people um, who are less famous within the century. And again, you see the same treatment for her shadow. And we recorded her voice in Cantonese for the exhibition. Right at the end of the urban section, you have this amazing figure, um, picture of three generations within a single household with the elderly matriarch in the center and um, the male relatives and female relatives either side in their full length garments together with their hand servants in two piece garments. As well as respectable women within the urban section, we have a whole host of images of courtesans. This shows you the um, salt merchant, Hu Shuiyan, surrounded by um, 12 beauties from um, Europe, from uh, Japan, and from re different regions across China. And these courtesans were really the kind of influencers of the day and impacted greatly on fashion of the 19th century. And you can see within the exhibition, amazing full length garments, hoods, and even details such as the hair extensions made in horse hair, which would have originally filled out these um, hats and so on, which we show within the exhibition. The robes have a most extraordinary detail. This is a period where you're on the cusp of um, the commercialization of handicrafts. And um, many of these ribbons and details would have been born in shops and garments made with the assistance of tailors to create these extraordinary um, items in new color palettes, festooned with imagery taken from popular novel and popular novels and dramas. We also include, of course, um, shoes for bound feet. Not all women had bound feet, certainly not the Taiping or the Hakka or working women, but elite Han women who had these tiny 10 centimeter feet and these shoes will be on display. And full garments, outfits, you can see through the puppets and other items that we include within the leisure section. In the global uh, part, this is arranged uh, in two halves, the first half centered around Guangzhou and the second half around the treaty ports and then finishes with international interactions, including missionaries and so on. As our key character, we choose the Hong merchant Mo Kua, who is um, Lu Guanghong, who lives between 1792 and 1843. And we've taken for the shadow key aspects of his portrait, including the official beads, rank badge, and um, the, the hat that he wore. Um, he was awarded um, uh, these, not through passing the imperial exams, but through purchasing his own rank. There are luxury goods included within the exhibition that show the extraordinary creativity and innovation of the 19th century. This fan has featured small images of women about a centimeter long with tiny um, 
five centimeter long ivory painted faces. This is blown up to show you the incredible detail within the fan. After the treaty ports were established, a whole new style of hybrid goods were made, combining Eastern and Western styles, such as evidenced by this punch bowl, which is um, uh, for a sweet punch. You can see the sugar tongs and sugar bowl together with six um, cups and this overlaid dragon motif. Materials which were specially created for exhibitions in Paris are also included in the show. This is an enormous five um, fold screen, which is inlaid with kingfisher feathers and painted shell. And on some of the garments for the treaty ports, you can see um, the arrival of steamships and how the arrival of um, the trains and steamships impacted um, fashion. This is a New Year print from 1873. So if you'd like to read more about the exhibition and the topics that are explored within it, we've produced these different books, um, China's Hidden Century, which is a collaborative book between um, seven authors, which follows the themes of the exhibition. But there's also Creators of Modern China, which has a hundred lives from empire to republic following the period following the period 1796 um, to 1912, written by 100 authors from 14 countries. We have a special issue of Arts of Asia, a conference which will be on the 8th and 9th of June, and a series of YouTube films and blogs, as well as an audio app, which um, will be available for people to um, use within the exhibition. So I'd like to end there and hand over to Julia, who is going to field uh, questions from um, the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for that um, wonderfully vivid introduction to the ideas and objects in the exhibition. I can see that uh, some questions have already arrived in the chat. Um, I'll take the first one, um, and then just alternate with Jessica. Um, so I'll pass the second one on to Jessica. Um, so I'll read the, them out together. The first question is, had Republicans Sun Yat-sen and Chu Jin traveled beyond China to see other ways of being? Uh, the second question, which I'll, I'll pass over to Jessica is, have the robes on loan from the uh, New York um, Met Museum inspired the designs of the art students involved in this exhibition. So I'll deal with the question about um, Sun and Chu Jin first. And yes, absolutely. Um, both were extremely cosmopolitan individuals. Sun Yat-sen was born in South China. He was educated in Hawaii and uh, Hong Kong. Hong Kong, he qualified as a doctor. And after he became an itinerant revolutionary from the second half of the 1890s onwards, he was effectively in exile for 16 years until the success of the 1911 revolution. And he spent that time traveling the world, talking to political thinkers, trying to get support for the, his own revolutionary ideas. Cho Jin was an extremely unusual person. She decided to break with an unsatisfactory arranged marriage. She had children at that, at that, that point, so around the turn of the 20th century. And she became one of the few women to travel to Japan to study. So quite a large number of um, male Chinese students went to Japan where they often studied um, scientific subjects, practical vocational subjects, but where they were also exposed to quite radical ideas about uh, reshaping uh, China's political and cultural systems. So some of the most famous radical figures of the 1900s, 10s and 20s 
really cut their teeth you know, had formative experiences in Japan um, in the late Qing and Cho Jin also was very much formed her political and cultural ideas were closely shaped by her experiences in Japan so that cosmopolitan collision of influences and experiences had a deep impact on radical individuals like Sun Yat-sen and Cho Jin. Um, Jessica, did you want to answer the question about the robes and the, um, uh, the fashion students? Yes, quite a contrasting um, question. But I would say that, um, of course, the shapes of the costumes have inspired some of the designs, particularly um, the unknown woman's costume. But it's mainly the retail designers within the British Museum who've been inspired by Sushi's robe to create an amazing range of um, silk scarves, tote bags, soaps, um, tea towels, and so on, which have all come out of the Dowager Empress's um, robe and her painting, which is in the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. Thank you. So the next two questions, I'll take the next one, unless Jessica would very much like to step in and then Jessica can take the one after that. So the next question is, who would have been the anticipated market for the prints of uh, someone like uh, Rin Xiong? And the question after that is, which part of the history was mostly hidden during the period covered by the exhibition. So um, Jessica, should I take the first one and you take the second? Okay. Uh, I, I might deflect the first question onto another painter actually of the second half of the 19th century who uh, became a very popular artist in Shanghai, a man called uh, Jun Bonyen, who I mentioned in my presentation um, and he's typical of a group of artists um, who are native local to southeast china which for hundreds of years had been the hub of cultural and literary elite production in china but this part of china was devastated by the taiping civil war Shanghai as a sort of semi-foreign enclave treaty port was relatively sheltered from the violence and the turmoil of the Taiping War. So many extremely talented artists migrated to Shanghai and they adapted their art and their practice to fit this new modernizing and more commercial market. So the range of, uh, for example, Ren Bonien's clients would be um, merchants, businessmen, shop owners, uh, officials, um, clerks, um, but you know, really anybody who could afford his paintings you know in, in in the past usually one had acquired in China one would acquire paintings through some kind of personal connection with the artist but the art market in Shanghai from the second half of the 19th century onwards it was it was a buyer's market um, and we can also get a sense of who these buyers would be by the fact that um, Rin Bonien would advertise his prints in the sort of new burgeoning modern press which emerged in Shanghai from the 1860s, 1870s onwards. So, you know, whoever is a kind of middle class, um, uh, uh, literate, uh, relatively affluent person would be the potential market for his work. So Jessica, the question to you was, which part of the history was mostly hidden during the period we've covered? I think that's, that it's important to think of it as hidden rather than secret. And so um, this is the first 19th century exhibition anywhere in the world. There've been amazing exhibitions of 19th century painting and 19th century photography but this is the first exhibition to really look at the 19th century in all its aspects through the lens of different sectors of society 
and highlighting individual people, some of whom are famous and some of whom really are not. I think in terms of what is hidden, it's maybe this idea of pulling people's lives out from the shadows. So for example, the unknown woman who really one wouldn't have known anything about at all is given a sort of constructive, constructive sorry, um, life through examining her painting and through imagining her, her voice and her physical appearance through this project with the Nissen Richards and the London College of Fashion. There are lots of people within the exhibition who are not famous, ordinary people whose lives um, are perhaps obscure and that this exhibition allows them to have a voice and an equal voice with other people that are very famous like Sashi or Li Hongzhang or whatever. Um, so I think it's this idea of emerging from shadows, the very lightness of being that I keep mentioning, but which comes up in the poetry, in some of the inscriptions, in the book by Lin Ching and so on. Um, this idea of kind of hidden lives, which are then shared with a, a much larger public, if that makes sense. Thank you very much, Jessica. I've um, just seen the time. There are three more questions. I'll just handle them very quickly. Um, there's, there's one which asks a question about why we chose that particular woman as the poster for the exhibition and Jessica's um, uh, answered that uh, very clearly already. Um, there was there's a question about was there opposition to foot binding before Mao and yes I would say absolutely the earliest campaigns against foot binding begin in the kind of uh, social movements, civil society movements of the late Qing. So that kind of social mobilization against certain customs and mores starts in the late Qing. So just two um, slightly larger questions. Uh, one asked if we could say more about life in the treaty ports. Um, uh, uh, before the international settlements were fully established, how much interaction was there between the Chinese and British merchants. Uh, I'll handle that. Um, last one for you, Jessica, quite a, a, a big one here. Um, a, a lister is taking a group of year nine and year 10 pupils to see the exhibition. They have no prior knowledge of this period. What could be the top three key messages that students of that age should know before their visit. So I'll quickly handle the question about uh, life in the treaty ports. So before the international settlements were established, before the treaty ports were created, it wasn't possible for uh, Europeans and Americans to live within those settlements such as Guangzhou, uh, Shanghai or so on. So Guangzhou was a hub for trade, but the um, Chinese and the European, American and Indian populations were kept separately. After the creation of the treaty ports, for example, the creation of the uh, international settlement in Shanghai in the 1850s and 1860s, um, uh, these locations were uh, quite contradictory places. Um, yes, they were places where Qing sovereignty was eroded. There, they were uh, places where um, uh, the uh, Chinese populations could be the uh, victims of horrendous sort of casual racism on the part of European and uh, American populations. At the same time, um, they did create a kind of uh, vibrant cosmopolitanism uh, through the new commercial opportunities that um, trade with international actors uh, created. Um, they are the place where um, China's press and publishing, modern press and publishing industries uh, take off. So they're extremely um, contradictory, often ambivalent spaces. Jessica, top three messages for year nine and year 10 pupils. 
Well, I think the main thing to say is that the exhibition is people centered and it's about creativity and about resilience. And it's about a multicultural society of the 19th century. So I would anchor those students by giving them some information about the Victorian age, about Florence Nightingale, um, Darwin, Dickens, Austin, and let them see what the equivalent were within China. And I think that there is something for every age group within the exhibition. But if they go with the understanding that this is an exhibition um, which is set in the 19th century, but is really about the individual experience, about creativity and coming through those difficult traumatic times of the 19th century and about resilience. I think that um, you should have a happy, interested, engaged class. So I think it's just for me to say um, thank you very much to um, Julia also and to say that the next um, key event um, for the exhibition will be on the 9th of June. Um, this will be at 6.45 in the evening and will be an amazing performance of the Imperial Concubine Intoxicated, which is an extract from a Peking opera performed um, by Cathy Hall. So I hope you enjoy that very much. And thank you all very, very much indeed um, for listening this evening. And I hope very much that you will all go and see um, the exhibition. Thank you.